would like to start by just checking. Does everybody know what the 12th man is in football? Do you all know that there are 11 players on the team? <laughs> so the 12th man is that extra something, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to Pep Guardiola. I think it has been for all of us. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted, actually, that it's quite a hard act to follow, so I'm really delighted that many of you have stayed on behind uh, after that to listen to mere mortals like myself. So thank you very much for that. Um, she's not here right now. I want to say thank you to Dr. Diana Collier for making all of this happen, um, to Liverpool University Press, to Professor Chris Harris for that lovely introduction, and to my ex-student who's not here but hopefully will watch the video, Mercedes Androbus, who's a graduate of the University of Manchester, please don't boo, and is now working for Manchester City Football Club and has taught me a lot about my own football club. So I, I am, I'm just going to come clean and say it, I'm a Man City fan. Okay, you're going to hear about that. Thank you. <laughs> and Pep's not here, but I would also like to say thank you, Pep Guardiola, for so much enjoyment over the last few years. Right, so this is probably the easiest conference paper that I've ever given in my 25 years as an academic. The two subjects that I'm going to be looking at today and that I'm going to be drawing some unexpected comparisons about have been at the center of my life for decades. This is the bit, if you ever watch Match of the Day, this is the point in the evening where I commit the footballer's faux pas and declare that being here today, today's result, is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And then I remember, a bit too late, that I have two beautiful kids <laughs> and a wonderful partner, and in my life, they generally come first, not always. This talk is not, is not a purely academic one, although it is, of course, supported by extensive reading and writing. And it's supported also by extensive fieldwork in Cuba and on the football terraces. So I'm going to start with a short autobiographical pause. I became a Man City fan some 50 years ago, around the age of four, when my late father, having arrived in Manchester in the early 1960s as an immigrant from India, took my siblings and me to our first football match at Main Road, as was then. At the time, as I understand it, his choice of city over United was based on a small informal survey he'd conducted with a few Mancunians he met in local pubs after work, many of whom told him that City was the working class team. My father was resolutely middle class, but I suspect that, as a first generation immigrant, he wanted to back the team that best represented what he saw as the grassroots identity of his new home. From the 1960s to the present day, I've lived and traveled in many locations, but I've supported my team and indoctrinated my children and some of my postgraduate students to do the same. Now that my father's no longer alive and his grandchildren are all adults, Manchester City is once again the binding force that keeps us in touch across three continents. Nothing can bring the Kumaraswamy family to collective tears quite so effectively as the video footage of Sergio's goal on the 13th of May, 2012. <laughs> Thank you, that's for the ladies and those others who, who enjoy that kind of thing. <laughs> but they've always been and continue to be periods when as a woman of Indian heritage, it's not easy to be accepted as a Man City fan. I no longer get called Ganga Din on the terraces, but I sometimes have to work quite hard to feel that I belong, and equally hard to normalize my presence amongst those who'd find it more comfortable to exclude me. In my case, this gesture usually involves unlimited singing and a lot of swearing. That is culture in its anthropological sense. There have also always been and continue to be periods of rapid and radical change at my football club, during which we fans have to work quite hard to keep up and keep on side. This paper proposes why we do keep going and why we should. So, Manchester City and Revolutionary Cuba. I've been working on post-1959 Cuba, uh, Cuban culture and society for nearly 20 years with an interest especially in how culture, as both artistic representation and everyday practice, is the glue that binds, for good and for bad, any society, 
and especially at times of rapid and radical social, economic, and political change. Cuba has certainly experienced such change. The Radical Revolutionary Project, launched in 1959, led to many professional sectors leaving the country for political and economic reasons, and began a period of family fragmentation which lasts to this day. Those who remained in Cuba after 1959 committed their lives to the euphoric task of building the new Cuba in the decade of the 1960s. They enjoyed a brief period of economic and political security in the 1980s under the protection of the Soviet bloc. And of course, they experienced the collapse of communism and severe economic austerity from the early 1990s. Since the economic collapse too, the pattern has been one of frequent, although sometimes more controlled, social change. The 11.5 million Cubans living on the island witnessed the rapid introduction of tourism in the 1990s as a quick fix for the devastated economy, with the resulting increase in social inequality. They witnessed mass and often illegal emigration for economic reasons, adding another layer of social fragmentation and generational conflict. They participated in or observed the attempt in the early 2000s to rebuild the nation following the economic crisis and to rebuild the nation through education and culture. The Fidel Castro-led Battle of Ideas. And they're now observing a more pragmatic, although cautious, period of economic reform, which is reflected today in the debates and the negotiations over the new Cuban constitu constitution. And yet the Cuban Revolution, understood as a process rather than an event, and despite regular moments of rupture and change, still bears the signs of continuity over nearly 60 years. Namely, a commitment to socialism and the provision of health and education as human rights, an internationalist approach to geopolitics, and an unwavering investment in culture, not only as a marker of national prestige, but also as a force for social well-being. Cuba, as anyone working on the area knows full well, always provides surprises, and forces you to question basic assumptions. My love for Manchester City also provokes much curiosity and surprise, not least amongst my academic colleagues and friends. So this paper is the consequence of many, many conversations with family and friends, conversations about football and about Cuba, that have helped me to realize that one must always question the principles, sorry, first principles, and arrive at understanding through observation, the analysis of empirical evidence and crucially, the recognition of the twin and compatible forces of emotion and analysis. So here are some common assumptions about Cuba. Many people believe that Cuba is a communist system where dialogue and debate have been shut down in the interest of maintaining a dynasty of dictators, notably Fidel Castro. Many people believe that Cuba is an island where people feel imprisoned by rigid social norms that expect obedience to the government and to the nation. And in relation to culture, many people believe that Cuba has a system whereby art has been subsumed to the dictates of politics and ideology. The work of myself and many others, however, tries to paint a slightly different picture. So a more nuanced view of Cuba might tell us that it's a system committed to an ever-evolving implementation of socialism, designed not from a copy of the Soviet Union, although that influence is certainly clear, but also from post-colonial models for development and sovereignty, self-determination, and from the lessons learned from its own colonial and neo-colonial history. We might better understand Cuba as an island where a rough blueprint for being Cuban has similarly evolved to adapt to rapid social change. And in relation to culture, we might better understand Cuba as a system which emphasizes the importance of culture for the project of sustaining a collective identity but a project which has experienced periods of debate about how best to define the project and its cultures. And most importantly for my work on Cuba, I can see what's emerged is a system which attempted to deconstruct first world Western notions of literature, which foregrounded a particular set of values and foregrounded those values in opposition to what might be happening they assumed in the developing world. So a first world recipe for literature, if you will, as an elite urban cultural activity with primarily aesthetic value and a predominantly cognitive function, and opposing this to what one might imagine literature might mean in the developing world, or even cheap, 
mass culture or humble popular folk culture, which it might be assumed has a primarily social value and a predominantly affective, affective emotional function. Literature from the first world, which might be understood to require specialist expertise and whose inaccessibility is one of the signs of its superiority against the imagined literatures of the developing world, which might project the notion that anyone with some guidance or training can gain expertise in creating literature and can make a valuable contribution to their own lives and to cultural life in general. Those notions are still ordered as a hierarchy. In other words, our first world notions are very much the Premier League and the developing world is somewhere down in Division Two. However, Cuba's different. And the key policy document for that difference then and still, the policy document for the deconstruction and reconstruction of culture in the Cuban Revolution is in fact a series of speeches made by Fidel Castro in 1961 to an assembled group of Havana-based artists and intellectuals who were concerned that the new revolutionary government would remove their rights and privileges and oblige them to follow a politically and ideologically determined function as artists. In these speeches, the palabras a los intelectuales, or words to the intellectuals, the central message is that specific policies and institutions to create a broader infrastructure for the practice of culture would and could revolutionize, revolutionize ideas about culture to allow elite cultural forms, such as literature, to become popularized and massified, uh, massified and to recognize and promote the multidimensional value and functions of culture, with a specific emphasis on mass cultural participation. In other words, under this prescription, both models, elite and mass, or popular, could coexist and feed off each other. For literature, this is especially interesting, as it opened the way for the massification of the activities of writing and reading. For example, the very successful 1961 literacy campaign, but also workshops, writing workshops, the expansion of the publishing infrastructure, the promotion of new, more accessible genres, such as testimonial writing, and many more examples. There's not enough time today to detail the evolution of those policies, but a relatively recent illustration can give you an idea of how literary culture is experienced in contemporary Cuba. So this is the Feria Internacional del Libro, or International Book Festival, at its height in the mid-2000s. In terms of access to the Cuban nation in the early 2000s, the Feria, for literature, was expanded to travel from the capital Havana across the country so that local writers and publics from the provinces and Havana-based writers who formed part of the caravana or caravan that moved across the country could interact and thus massify and diversify the activity of literature. At its height in 2006, and bear in mind Cuba's population of 11.5 million, the feria sold 5 million books and attracted half the population. But it also attracted criticisms from some writers that such mass participation trivialized or diluted the real worth of literature, the individual and singular act of authorship and creation of the book. In our study of the feria, we argued instead that the ecosystem developed from 1959 onwards to promote literary culture as mass, popular, and elite activity, two levels that were mutually constitutive and inherently compatible, allowed Cuban literary culture to enjoy two reciprocally beneficial forms of cultural prestige and value, as a ciudad letrada, the lettered city, and as a ciudad de los letrados, which is quite difficult to translate, but we might say something like the city of readers and writers. But culture, of course, is not just about prestige. As I mentioned earlier, it's also a source of and medium for well-being. Literature, and specifically acts of reading, allows us to construct our identities in highly complex ways. It allows us to imagine ourselves outside our normal context, to disagree with fictional characters, or to see them as role models, sometimes both at the same time. It allows us to note and mark generational belonging through our reading tastes, to understand our present, past, or future lives through reading about the present, past, or future lives of others. Perhaps most significantly, reading literature creates the ability to create narratives of self through the act of reading the narratives of others. In short, our interactions with culture change culture, and they change us. My current project continues the central theme of literary culture and participation, but this time the fieldwork is based in eastern Cuba. 
<clears throat> it explores the continued importance of nation and how local cultural participation relates to national identity, to being Cuban. Again, for reasons of time, I'll give just one illustration of the complex functions of culture in Cuba. So, the local iteration of the Feria del Libro. This takes place in this particular instance, uh, and the photograph that you have here is the local iteration in the city of Bayamo, which is the capital of Granma province, an eastern province and a largely rural province. At a local poetry reading of local poets, which you can see here, organized by one of Bayamo's principal cultural centers, Ventana Sur, the organizer was upset to see that locals did not respect the open air space dedicated for those minutes to the reading of poetry after he witnessed a local individual shout across the event to attract the attention of a friend, just as a poet was in full flow. After the reading, my friend the organizer insisted that in fact, uh, sorry, my friend the organizer insisted that this showed una falta de respeto, or a lack of respect, whilst I argued back vigorously that in fact it demonstrated the opposite. In my mind, it was evidence of the successive policies which have given Cubans of all kinds a sense of entitlement to occupy public spaces for culture that in many other societies are segregated along class, race, and gender lines. My point here is that whilst participation in public space is always a contested concept that carries with it certain norms of behavior or certain cultural practices which might at times be violated or transformed, policies can be developed in order to emphasize the benefits of participation in culture as both representation singing on the terraces, and everyday life, attending the match, support for one's team. These policies promote a sense of collective belonging, however small or large that collective is. They promote a right to occupy public space, a right to express oneself creatively. Anybody who knows the words to the often complex Man City songs that have developed over the years cannot fail to acknowledge that these are texts and performances that fulfill many functions before, during, and after a match. And all of this contributes very positively to social integration and collective well-being by allowing people to self-identify but also simultaneously self-differentiate from any given collective whilst contributing to it. The local and physical nature of that contribution is key as it's the most effective starting point from which to then imagine and perform broader identities that contribute to our well-being that make us feel better individually and collectively. The other key point here is that participation of this kind is not only an activity that engages the mind. As you can see from these photos, it's also underpinned and infused by moral and emotional components. It creates spaces and opportunities to perform in public the ability to do the right thing, to practice and demonstrate the kinds of values and morals that, yes, have been inculcated and promoted by Cuba's revolutionary system since 1959, but that also characterize societies across the world. Physical participation allows one to experience locally a moral commitment to an emotional engagement with something greater than oneself, whether that greater thing is a revolutionary society or a football team. These moral dimensions, in a sense, provide the connection between understanding and feeling. In post-1959 Cuba, culture is the 12th man. And now to Manchester City. What could link, link a multinational enterprise whose success, it's assumed, is underpinned by a vast and complex financial model to a small Caribbean island that continues to advocate socialist values? Many commentators in the UK press note regularly that the club is deeply implicated in a multi-billion pound industry, supported by massive transnational flows of money, and that it actively seeks an increasingly global audience whilst attempting to keep on board the traditional local support, the local working class which first attracted my father to support the club in the 1960s. And yet my own experience of supporting my team leads me to make those unlikely connections with revolutionary Cuba. Football, for the public and the players alike, contains multiple and complex cultural functions and effects. Whilst many commentators will focus on the financial drivers that motivate players to train harder, work harder, win trophies, or simply survive relegation, the complex motivations of footballers are not unlike the motivations of a Cuban writer working within the revolutionary system. Yes, money and mass recognition, 
but perhaps more importantly, peer esteem, public prestige, and professional pride. For a spectator, a football match, like the Feria del Libro, can also carry multiple motivations and effects. It can signal collective belonging to something greater than oneself, loyalty and hard work, national and local pride, local pride and unity. And whether it's a football match or a revolutionary march or demonstration, there's always a future orientation to the performance of those values. In other words, both these activities are infused with moral and emotional incentives and rewards. Whether sponsored by state or market then, top-down policies and values that support cultural participation, such as a commitment to increased access, the creation of a sustainable institutional infrastructure, have limited effects unless these are internalized and customized at cognitive, affective, and moral levels by individuals and social groups. In Cuba, much of this work of internalization and customization is done via participation in culture. For football, participation as a spectator can provide this function. It is, for me, the only space in contemporary English society where people from different social classes, genders, and cultural heritages come together to occupy the same space. They may not always share the same values outside their football team. In fact, I suspect they rarely do. But like the magic of reading, they're changed by their participation with others, and their participation itself has the potential to change the game. They are the 12th man. However, it's only when these processes of internalization and customization take place, are made visible, and are fed back into the institutional structure that a more effective harmonization of interests, always with tensions, conflicts, and moments of resistance, can take place. Out of this process can come multiple sources of well-being and prestige. So for both revolutionary Cuba and for Manchester City, this paper carries a warning against the development of exclusionary policies and the monetization of culture to the detriment of its other drivers. The 12th man, local participation, in all of its diverse and contradictory manifestations, is the key to creating and sustaining vibrant, resilient, responsive, and inclusive cultural practices, and, dare I say it, to continued footballing success. Just as happened with Sergio's goal in 2012, my life is now complete. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Pep, wherever you are, and thank you for listening.